All right, everybody, I see 1.33 on the clock, which means we're only running three minutes late, but there's good reason for that. We actually just finished up flashing all of this year's swatches on site. That's right. So uh, they will be available for sale, or if they're in your kick and tier, you're going to get one, but they are here and ready, which is a minor miracle. <laughs> All right, so I am super hyped up on adrenaline right now. Uh, if I'm talking fast, yell at me. If I'm not making any sense, yell at me. If you want to, just yell at me. <laughs> Love it. Uh, so let's get right in. Everyone here already knows what a swage is, right? Yes. No? He d okay. A couple so swag is sort for swag badge. I didn't make it up. I've just been rolling with it. Uh, we've done it for a couple years. I actually see at least one of last year's over there. It's blinking around in a nice hexagon pattern. Um, they're circuit boards. They're fun. They usually have some sort of games, lights, you know, the kind of stuff that people at MacFest love. Uh, so this is going to be a, a short journey through this year's, like the hardware that we did, and then we'll talk maybe a little about firmware, and then we'll do like a Q&A. Sound good to everyone? Yeah. Great. So let's start off with uh, this dev kit. This is boring looking. No one likes a rectangle and no one likes all those wires, but this is something new that we did this year. So I actually made this in, I think it was March, which is way earlier than we've ever started developing. And we basically had these dumb hardware boards so we can give them out to people to develop firmware on, so we basically we're trying to remove bottlenecks in the process. So we got started way earlier this year. Uh, a couple things to note here. Uh, if you've ever used an ESP12F, there's some spy lines on it. Uh, you think you can use them, but you can't. Those are internal spy lines that just have pads, and if you try to twiddle them, the whole thing crashes, so don't. Uh, other mistakes I made here, the mic was on backwards, because I was dumb, and it required a bunch of manual rework, including on the programmer, I crossed serial RX and TX. <laughs> so uh, yeah, getting in there with an X-Acto knife under a microscope and doing a little bit of circuit surgery. But hey, once you fix it all up, it works. <laughs> and from there, uh, we made DevKit 2, which is kind of like DevKit 1, except everything was in the right place this time. Hooray. Yeah. And we also made Programmer, too. So the Programmer is something new that we did this year also. Uh, and this breaks out all of the pins. Oh yeah. <laughs> it breaks out all the pins so you can easily like add peripherals or remove things or like test during development. But it also means that when we are manually flashing them by hand, uh, we had 50 of these. And programming takes about 10 seconds, so we really ripped through them. This was in contrast to last year when we had a bed of nails programmer designed by Jillian over here, which worked great, but we only had four of them, so it was a bit slower. Uh, there was also a DevKit 201. These were actually manufactured by our contract manufacturer, not me by hand. And you'll notice that the screen on this one, oh yeah, there's a screen on them this year. The, sc the screen on this one is like this weird blue yellow thing, because we said, hey, get us the blue screens. And the manufacturer said, OK, we'll get you the blue and yellow ones. <sighs> <laughs> but this is why you do things early and you get dev kits, because you iron out those bugs ahead of time, and no one's screen should be blue and yellow. Uh, what else happened on this one? We also added in a new accelerometer. And you're right, manufactured overseas. Uh, so as I said, we have these dev kits, which means we could do new and exciting development things like really easily. So here is a swage that's running at 1.9 volts. So we did a little bit of battery testing just to see like how low can they go before they actually conk out. And well, 1.9 volts was the answer. But I also set this up in like 10 seconds, where last year we would have had to like hand solder a bunch of stuff and it would have been a mess. Uh, the dev kits also mean we can add stuff. When we did the dev kit, we actually had a microphone on it that ended up getting scrapped. Sorry, everybody. But we put a buzzer on instead. Woo! <laughs> and we could prototype the buzzer, again, in like an order of seconds, just with some jumper cables onto a breadboard. So after the dev kit was pretty much set, we learned that, hey, we're doing this kind of monkey theme this year. Let's make it not a rectangle. Let's make it a barrel. So we had some barrels made up. Uh, this is bare for all the world to see. It's a little more exciting than a rectangle. It's not the final one, so don't, don't worry. Uh, and I actually messed up pretty good on this one also. 
uh, because the OLED was flipped. So if you go back to the dev kit, the OLED connector actually wraps around. You can see it on the top. Uh, but on the barrel, it doesn't wrap around. It's right there. And I forgot to reverse all the contacts. So to prove everything worked, you just had to solder it on backwards and then flip it up. Don't worry, the finals don't look like this. Again, this is why we do testing and development. Uh, the accelerometer was also sometimes flaky, even though that circuit didn't change, which struck me as weird and not good. Shadowing. Yeah, foreshadowing, right? Um, so getting into a little more circuity here for those technical minded, and I'll try to breeze through this one, and you can ask you any questions later. Uh, the accelerometer talked on I squared C. So you have your data and your clock lines. And the difference between the dev kit and the barrel is that the dev barrel had these really long, really close data and clock lines. And if you remember your basic electricity and magnetism, when you put current through a wire and it's next to another wire, you can induce a current. So you get these weird little crosstalks. You can see the clock signals on the top, and every time that it goes high to low, there's a little ripple on the data line at the bottom. That's not a clean signal. That's not good. And when you're working with very low-cost uh, accelerometers with higher tolerances, uh, you'd see some problems. Uh, and so we ended up solving that two ways. One was to add some series resistors before the data and clock lines hit the accelerometer. And you can see here, I actually had to go in with an X-Acto knife, cut the circuit, scrape away the resist, solder it on under a microscope, and put it all back together. Um, and the other fix was to do some software trickery, uh, which Charles Lohr was in charge of, who is not here, but maybe showing up later. I think he was going on the battery run to buy you know, 6,000 batteries for these things. <laughs> Um, but the, the short of it is that there was a couple harrowing days where the factory came back and said, oh, all of your tests are failing. And we said, well, that's not good. <laughs> but don't worry, we got past it. <laughs> and then we ended up with uh, barrel 103. So this was actually the first prototype final one we got back from the factory. It still works on the same programmer from you know however many slides ago. So we didn't have to redesign that or touch that at all. Uh, and we also put this headband over the OLED because um, it's made of glass, and two of the corners were actually way more susceptible to breaking in test. Uh, and actually, I'll let Jillian talk a little bit more about test on this slide. <laughs> yes, this, this, so uh, this is Hagwood. Uh, oh, that, here, try that one. So this is Hagwood. Um, so he's uh, Tosa Inu, which, it, which will bled to do the doggy version of sumo wrestling. He literally, it's those literally a sport where they try to shove each other out of a wing. Um, so he has 100 pounds of I will destroy anything you attach to me. <laughs> um, he was our durability tester. I made a bunch of different test boards up and um, tried them. We tried several different things and we determined that the most cost effective, so the cheapest thing that he took a whole week to break was this headband that we have. So, uh, but he would destroy. If I put one on with no headband, um, he destroyed it in about 12 hours. Um, the headband lasted about a week until I still don't know what he managed to do. But um, so I'm pretty confident that uh, Magfest will not damage too many of them. <laughs> if you swing your swag violently for a full week and break it, that one's on you. <laughs> Uh, you can also notice you give it to my dog. That's also on you. Yeah. Uh, you'll also notice that on this one, we were actually testing uh, one of the different options, which was a full bezel. Um, it ended up just being larger, a little more expensive, and didn't offer better protection, so we went with the headband. So I hope you gave Hagrid lots of scratches for this and maybe a treat. Oh, yes. Oh, also, we made a banana. <laughs> Uh, which is actually the same electrically schematic as the barrel. It's the same firmware as the barrel, but it is rarer and therefore cooler. So if you see someone with a barrel, meh. If you see someone with a banana, though, mm. Also incentive, I know there's some like kick in tiers to get like bigger and better swag bags at MAGFest. If you want cool stuff like this, you know, higher tiers. <laughs> Uh, and Charles, the guy who did the uh, I squared C fix, also did the banana layout. So when he walks in, we'll give him a round of applause. And if he doesn't walk in, we'll clap for him later anyway. 
Uh, we can come back to that later. This is actually a video I put together for the uh, manufacturer to show how to program and test one of these things. I find it kind of fascinating. Most people kind of find it, will find it boring, so we'll do it at the end. I like you. There we go. Thank you. Um, but the outcome of the manufacturing is that we had boxes of these things lined up in this electrostatic pink foam, which is great. We ended up ordering a little north of 3,000, uh, which is a lot of boxes and a lot of things packed in. I mean, it's a lot of boxes and a lot of things packed in. Um, but we tore through unpacking, flashing, and repacking them this morning in about three hours. Uh, so <laughs> We had a team of about a dozen people coming in and out, helping out where they could. Very grateful to anyone who was there. Uh, thank you. Hopefully, next year we'll do it earlier and not at event because it's stressful, but glad that it got done. And of course, hardware, uh, which we've been talking about this whole time, is nothing without firmware. Well, I guess it's not nothing. You could throw it at someone and it would hurt. But the firmware is really what makes it special. Uh, so I said earlier that we had dev kits that we distributed to people. I think it was like in June or July. Uh, we actually have uh, Moriarty over here, the suave dude in the eye patch. He wrote this game called Tiltrads, which is totally not Teltra, Tetris. Uh, and it is accelerometer based, so you're going to have a lot of fun with that. Uh, Aiden Gert, who is in transit, wrote a game called Joust. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with JS Joust. Yeah. OK, a couple people here are familiar. If you're not, Google it. It's really fun. Also, you'll be able to play it on your Swag this year with your friends uh, anywhere you want. Uh, BB Kiwi is actually a really fascinating individual. And by fascinating, I mean he's a retired mathematician professor from New Zealand. Uh, and he's actually not going to be at MacFest at all, but kind of got absorbed into the project and had a lot of fascinating ideas. So he wrote two of the modes on here, Maze, which is a maze, and it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, couldn't pass it up. And he also wrote Color Shake. Uh, and of course, every good swatch has a bunch of LEDs. Last year, it was reactive to your voice. This year, it's reactive to shaking it all a bunch of different ways. So I'll let you explore that, see what you like, which hopefully is everything. Uh, and then Angelic Kinetic, that guy in the bottom is actually me. Uh, I wrote Snake. Uh, it's Snake. I'm sure you've all played Snake at one point or another. Uh, I wrote a Music, which is a synthesizer. So for all you musicians out there, or aspiring musicians, or people who just like it, making noise, that one's for you. Uh, and then we also have this gallery. We figured if we have this nice OLED, may as well throw some neat images on there. So it's preloaded with a couple of fun things, maybe a couple of songs, if you can find them. And there's also some locked images. So there's some challenges, which if you ask me nicely, I might tell you what they are. Otherwise, you'll have to find them on your own. And maybe you can like unlock some even cooler images. Um, that's kind of what I had. I guess if, I don't know if you want to talk more about Tiltrads at all. Uh, I mean, I can just speak to the, I guess, the, the software process in general. So I, I came onto the project uh, at a meeting that was happening during MagStock. Um, they were looking for people to help do modes, and uh, I thought uh, I found the last year's Swatch incredibly fascinating, so I signed on for it. They mailed me one of the dev kits with the, uh, the programmers. I was able to set it up at my uh, office because we do some custom electronic work with the ESP. Charles works with me. Uh, eventually, he'll get back here and like this will all come full circle. Uh, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, it came down to uh, you know uh, setting my time. I didn't. I knew I had. In the future, I'd maybe like to do a mode that's more um, original in its design, but they had been looking for someone to get something together quickly that was legally uh, distinct but resembles Tetris <laughs> controlled by the accelerometer. And uh, yeah, I said I can make that work. And uh, yeah, I hope, uh, I hope people really enjoy it. He knocked it out. You're going to love it. Um, I guess, was there anything else that you wanted to add? I realize we... So uh, we were also working more up to the deadline this year, which is why I'm way less prepared than last year. If anyone remembers last year's presentation, it was like a full hour's worth of stories and stuff, and this year was 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> which just leaves plenty of time for Q&A as well, but yeah, I guess... sad that if your uh, contract manufacturer in China decides, it's like, oh, I'll save you some money. I'll uh, give it to some guy in a business name. Oh. Persistent cow? Persistent cow. Yes. Persistent cattle. Persistent oh, so, so. cow. Never ship with persistent cattle. <laughs> There's a lot of silence over there, so I'll expound on this just a bit. Well, I, I can condense it down. So there was naturally a little bit of miscommunication in the process because communicating is hard. Uh, we told our manufacturer that we need them here by event, and they said, you got it, boss. 
<laughs> and the way that shipping works when you're working with a contract manufacturer is the manufacturer isn't the shipper. There's a separate company that does it. Uh, so DHL was the one that we ultimately used, but even then there's a middleman between the two called a shipping manager. And so the factory will hand over all these boxes to the shipping manager, and then the shipping manager will do like customs paperwork and get it to DHL and make sure it's on a plane and all that other fun stuff. Well, the shipping manager that we used, whose name was Persistent Cattle, um, not sure if that's a translation or whatever, um, he just kind of got the boxes and looked at them for four days, seemingly, which gave all of us hives because there wasn't a lot of margin for error. Uh, and Charles, once again, the, the magic man who's not here, made a lot of phone calls a lot of, across a lot of time zones, talked to the manufacturer and the shipping manufacturer and DHL and basically coordinated and made sure that they are here today, which they are. So he's not here yet, but let's all give it up for Charles. Uh, do either of you want to talk for like another five minutes? I got a Dak just called. I'd like to reply. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. I, I just wanted to take a moment to shout out. Um, so one of the things about us having a buzzer this year is that we could do music. And I'm I'm a programmer. And the great thing about these is that graphics for this is just drawing lines and recs. And I, and I can make that work. <laughs> but um, music is not something that I can do. So I wanted to shout out uh, my friend uh, Dan uh, Dan Solo Austin. Dan Austin is um, a, a musician. Uh, some of you may know him. He's a, a streamer uh, under the uh, banner group, the Rom Runners. Um, and he uh, went above and beyond to get me some really good music really quickly, including like my, quite frankly, absurdly unreasonable request, which was, hi, I like 80s synth for this mode. How do you do that with one channel? And then he was just sort of like, dot, 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 uh, over me with the channel. I was like, yeah, okay, I think it can make that work. And uh, I, I hope you'll be, as, uh, you'll be as pleased with the results as I was. Um, in terms of, uh, I guess, just general software stuff. Um, honestly, what was great about uh, the, the workflow this year was that we, we had the, the underlying basics of like the code base to work into. Like everything, like hooking into the mode was super easy. Um, I ended up starting the work for my mode. Uh, Charles has a, uh, a cabin that he sometimes retires to do work in. <laughs> and he will invite people over to, uh, to suffer his madness. <laughs> and uh, we uh, ended up getting started on it uh, there. And um, the the, the whole process was just honestly pretty fairly smooth. That being said, I kind of knew I had to set a goal about uh, November, December, my uh, company starts doing a, a big arcade trade show called IAPA, and so I knew I had to have all my stuff done before then. So uh, I think, like, you know, obviously about, you know, a month and a half before things get going in earnest, I put up a message to the channel, it's like, this is the version that's done. I have to go now. Good luck with everything else. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty much my experience with Tiltrads. Did you have anything you wanted to, to add or to speak to? Um, just that we, we wanted, to, I'll go back and talk a little bit about the uh, design process that we had um, all along. We knew that we wanted to do something different with the, with the hard wheel. Um, last year, we really focused on, last year we really did, um, we really focused on the LEDs and the microphone is kind of our key key features. So we were looking at uh, what, other hard, what other hardware can we put in, what else could we do, and we made a list, we tested a bunch of things. I even had a prototype that I don't have here with me of fitting a full-size uh, 28 millimeter arcade button into a swag, and I still like that, and I still hope we can do that someday. <laughs> but um, ba basically, we boiled, we boiled down on that list, and we found, hey, the solarometers, we can afford them. There's a lot of cool stuff we can do with them. Uh, joust was actually the original driver. Um, Dale, we thought it would be cool to be able to do joust with swag. So um, that that was pretty much the thought process there on the screen. Willie, we, we looked at it and we said, hey, there are a few things we can do. Sometimes people ask, could you use, could you have used the ESP32? Um, if you're on the technical side, much more powerful process. Or we pretty much we could choose either to go up to that or we could really push the limits of the 8266 and have a screen. It's amazing that those little OLED screens have come down to the point where we can afford to put one on the swag. Um, really, really excited about that. 
the, the, that was our key, um, our key piece, and really that brainstorming. I mean, we threw out like, wouldn't it be cool if it was a banana? And like, no, we'll make it something practical like a bill. And then Charles goes and says, ah, I'll design the banana. So we made bananas. Um, <laughs> we already have some crazy ideas for next year. Um, I'm really loving the uh, two shape, one swags, two shapes, make an extra crazy one. So. Looking forward to seeing people. Um, also, we are aware that it's not ideal for the panel to be the before you guys get your swages. That's unfortunately how it worked out. Uh, we're definitely going to try next year to have it a bit later in the event so you guys can pick yours up. Um, that's the main things I have. Do we want to take questions? Or um, Andrew will be back in a few minutes. He had to go deal with a little uh, finding the pallet uh, so that can actually get to the expo hall. Yeah. So I, I yeah. Let's let's do questions. Uh, are there many questions? Yes, you in the back with the hat. What's the what's the uh, circuit board programmed in? Uh, the circuit board is programmed in C. Okay. The um the foam wheel is programmed in C. The circuit board we design in KiCad. So, what was one of the biggest pitfalls as you as you were working through for like some of the dev? You know, I think the biggest surprise pitfall for us was that the signal path issues with the I2C bus got worse as we did. So we had it debugged, we had it walking in with the dev kit, we solved the dev kit signal issue. Then we get the prototype one. Um, there was another prototype one that wasn't in the presentation um, of badges, which is why I have a slash yellow. Um, it is Ah uh, yes, a special ultra limited edition yellow barrel because we wanted to see what the yellow would look like. Um, we get this, and I'm installing the foam wheel, and I'm guessing I'm like, uh, guys, tilt lads doesn't tilt unless you're on USB. If you have batteries in, it doesn't work. <laughs> So um, lots of troubleshooting veil and trying different um, different values. We had to adjust the resistor values, um, tinkle with that quite a bit. Uh, and the factory was very helpful with that because uh, we were already starting to manufacture the final one at the time we found that um, that, that was a new issue. And then Charles also did some foam wheel magic that I don't really understand that part of the code, uh, but he did something and it works now. So, yay, <laughs> Charles. Yeah, uh, I, if I can segue with, uh, with that, my, my experience with that, just because like I, I had built tilt rats at that point. Like I said, I basically had to be done earlier in the project. And then I, I got on the Slack channel, it's like, accelerometer doesn't work. And I was like going through my head like, uh oh, well. That uh, that shoots it because uh, uh, one of the the from a from a game design limitation, one of the things that we were working with is that the swag has two buttons that Emode can take advantage of. There's a third button that's more for like menu, um, that but we're not supposed to really we're not making use of that. That has functions for the swag overall. Uh, so and that was uh, that was an intentional limitation. One yes. of the things we did, we knew we could we could have just put. A up, down, left, right, A, B, select, start. We could have squeezed that on there. Would have had to use shift register, but we could have just given you a set of classic Game Boy controls and make as that would have been easy. That would have been, I'm not going to say boring, but it's been done quite a bit. A lot of people have done those projects, and we wanted to really drive doing something different and interesting, and it was a bit more interactive. So we said, no, no, guys, you only get two buttons and an accelerometer will do. And that really drove some really cool game design stuff. Yeah, I mean, the reality is that that constraint is helpful. When you're, when you're doing any kind of game development, it can be helpful to kind of constrain what you're working with. That's honestly why I love this project is because I really only have the small screen. There's only so much you can do. It's single color, uh, but you get to kind of like drill down into that as much as you can like what what can you do within that process and so um if you look at tiltrads one of the things i did was um the the 
I mean, obviously, I think many people here are familiar with Tetris Effect, sort of the, the more psychedelic, almost like spiritual Tetris experience. Um, uh, one of the things that I tried to do was add like, kind of an effect because the way that the only way that I could fit everything that I needed onto the screen, there still ended up being kind of these these dead areas on the side where you just have to score. So I tried to do sort of a, a, a speed scrolling effect that's very uh, demo scene, uh, if you're familiar with like demo scene type effects. So um, next year maybe do some Mode 7 stuff uh, because that's potentially in the cards with some more time. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was really cool to be able to be in a space where you have uh, these limitations on you and, and you have to make that work. Any other questions? Oh, uh, Red Hat in the back. So, uh, what's the story behind the secret message in the back of last year's Swatch underneath the battery? Uh, hopefully Dak will show up and he can explain himself on that one. <laughs> I cannot confirm nor deny the presence of any secret messages on any swatches. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, next up. Uh, yes, you in the cap in front. I was really hoping that would be the theme this year, though. I tried to hold him to that. Um, can we get a copy of the firmware to add our own notes? Uh, the yes. firmware is open it source. Is open source. It's currently up on GitHub yeah. now. Cool. Would you be able to post to GitHub uh, later on? Yes. Let's make sure it's on the Swag site. Um, when Andrew gets back, he can link to it because it's on his GitHub, and yeah. I don't remember the name off. I don't. I have it bookmarked. I don't remember what off the top of my head. Well, I can uh, look it up. Right oh, now. Yeah. Go ahead and look it up. Let's put it up. Um, I would also say, like after the con, we wrote a bunch of people. Yes, and we'll definitely make sure that the we post on the subreddit after con too with the uh, with the phone wheel, um, and we will. Oh, there's another. That's another good thing to mention. We do have a limited number of dev kit, the dev kit programmers for sale. We ordered 50 of them. They are at the mulch booth. Um, they are not. We're not really advertising them. Um, but if you're looking to do, if you want to do development or custom firmware, um, by far the easiest thing to do is go buy a program. Um, then it's just a very easy USB plug-in, rather than having to actually attach to pins and that sort of thing. So. And uh, as you can see, currently up on the there, we have a link to it. It's uh, GitHub.com slash A E Feinstein F E I N. S T E I N uh, super dash 2020 dash swag dash firmware. So if you search for that, you should find it. And uh, and uh, we'll make sure that it goes up onto the swag site so that you can reference it there. Do you all have any uh, informational spin for the sheer swag potentiality, or is it one of these things where it's kind of play around with it? So the nice thing about one of the great things about um, hi, what I miss. <laughs> uh, we were talking about how great you are. And how, okay. Uh, you Continue. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the um, th that connector. It's actually a PCIe connect. Want to it. It's a single lane PCIe connector. Don't plug it into your motherboard. We haven't tested that, but it will probably break something. It doesn't use the PCIe pinout, just the shape. Actually, if you do plug it in, be sure to take a video and post it, because I, I think that would be hilarious. But don't be, do it on the computer. You can't, or yeah, be sure to take now. a video of it, but do, we are not liable for anything that happens. Let's just so go ahead and that, clear the so air on that, that right now. So there is that port, and if you wanted to design an add-on or a peripheral, um, it, it is possible to use that as an expansion port. I think of it like the expansion port on the bottom of the original NES. It's this really cool connector that can do all kinds of things and probably nobody will ever do anything with it. But um, hopefully, you know, I would, I would love to make, I'd love to make expansions. I'd, what I'd, I'd really love to see somebody make an expansion and show up next to you with uh, their own add-on board plugged in there. Uh, all the pins are exposed, so if you, the easiest thing to do would be if you had like an I2C, um, another I2C peripheral, just throw it on those pins, um, and it should, you should be able to weed it out, just connect to it just fine from, from that pin out. And I don't know if it's been mentioned already, because 
I literally had to run this by just down to merch. Also a little out of breath. Uh, we do have some extra programmers. Um, we plan on putting them up for sale, but I'm not sure how at this point. The easiest thing, if this is something that interests you and you want to hack around with it or join the team, send an email to the email that's up there, circuitboards at magfest.org. Can't promise we'll get to it at MagFest, but I will get back to you. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah. Was there a, uh, a function of the board that you guys wanted to add, but you scrapped because of time? So the dev kit originally had a microphone, which is what we had last year. And we figured, like, oh, we'll just add more stuff and not take anything off. The microphone, to be able to sample it at a clean uh, 8 kilohertz, you know, enough to get some interesting information out of, used a hardware timer, not a software timer. There's only one of those, maybe two of them, but one of them that was available to us on the ESP. The buzzer this year, if you want a nice clean tone, also has to run at a very specific clock interval. So we ended up using that hardware timer to drive the buzzer instead of pull the microphone, which meant no microphone. Would have been nice, ran into a hardware limitation. Not sure what we would have done with it, but uh, that's something that we ended up cutting. I think that's the only thing that we cut. Uh huh. Yep. Yes. So I, no, no, that's not. I, so I did mention before that there are some unlocks in the gallery, um, where if you complete certain challenges on the games, you'll unlock images. There may or may not be a way to circumvent that. Um, I'll leave it up to you. But one other thing I will mention on that that is out of the box is one of the little bits of code we, we used, uh, there's a screen sable mode um, that it goes into when it's idle at the main menu, which is the white dances from the last unit. We just took that white dance code and put it in. So it'll start randomly doing the white dances when, you, when it's idle. So just if you just want to wind in, in an attract mode, um, it'll kick that on if you just leave it on the main menu and let it sit for a minute. Um, that's, that's just a little extra thing we threw in. It's kind of a swing table. I don't think it actually saves a swing. Yes? Y'all just made me think of something else. Uh, is there any backwards connectivity between swags and years of each other? Uh, not as of yet. Uh, we, have not for, we have not implemented that in firmware. Right. If you wanted to white custom, actually, no, BBQ we did um, for testing, actually. Right. So the hardware is capable of it. We do not have this, the games are different this year, so they can't. But if you did have this, yeah. if you decided to make your own build of the same game, the hardware is able to talk to each other. And it's possible that in a future year we'll do something that's able to talk to yeah. previous year. So, just, but this year the software is all new, so there are no games that are the same between them. But the hardware is certainly capable. Well, the software is not entirely all new. The the connection code that we wrote for last year's Reflector game uh, was reused for Joust. Uh, it was actually, it used to be part of the game, then it was separated out and refactored into a separate software module. Uh, to test this, I did have some of the new stuff running on an old Swag just to make sure that it, I didn't break anything in the process. So it is definitely technically possible. Um, wasn't written into the spec. It requires a lot. It basically requires us now to know what we're doing next year. And we barely know what we were doing a week ago, so. This is also fun when um, I, I built the foam wheel one day and I was like, uh, hey, Andrew, uh, the foam wheel's suddenly not turning all the LEDs on. And then he's like, oh, you need to set this environment variable because I added something to the make file that, tell, that tells it which one and you have a newer dev kit than the one yeah. it Work, Working on teams is hard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I learned a lot about uh, people and management and specs and expectation through this project more so than I learned technically. Uh, it, it really showed me how much I'm an idiot in so many ways. Uh, all right. Sorry, That's fine. You, you, get, you got your hand up. I mean, I'm going to point at it. Uh, did you learn a lot from a technical aspect from going through this project? 
Uh, I learned a little bit, so I, I came in with a pretty strong technical background. Um, I write embedded microcontroller firmware for a living, not on the ESP platform, so there were some ins and outs of the ESP uh, 8266 that I had to learn. Um, but by and large, you know, I was familiar with the tools um, and the process. I installed Walt Pile in the stack um, and all useful experience. Um, so I, I do, I've done a bit of microcontrol, especially some older microcontrollers, but in terms of getting into modern, um, modern development on the ESP over the past few years, yeah, I've, I've gotten a lot out of that. And also, um, especially around uh, some of the modern board design. Um, yeah, I've, I've learned a lot watching watching these guys. Um, the, the part I the part I've been focused on is the physical design of the hardware and testing a lot of those physical factors and making sure my dog can't destroy it and that sort of thing. Um, well, you also don't just watch. Like you did write some firmware this year, and you were you were asking a couple of questions, which I think we tried to answer adequately. That's the other thing, right? It's a team. You can't expect everyone to know everything. But you should at least have an environment where you're comfortable to ask a question and hopefully get a reasonable answer. Uh, so we try to encourage that. Have you all considered doing like some sort of zombie meta game? And if so, would that uh, make this one as complicated? Stay tuned. That is something that we considered and we determined that it was not a good fit for Supel. And it's probably not going to be a good fit for the theme of the next Magstock. But it is something we're talking about, and we think we nothing definite, but we think that Magstock may be an excellent place to do that. There's a different team doing the swages for Magstock. Yeah. But, um, we'll, we'll really yes. Sound the the zombie. Um, somebody actually did. That was Aiden Gertz. So the guy who wrote yeah. Joust this year also wrote uh, Zombie Tag, which we played at Magstock last year. Um, yeah, I, I think we didn't really want a ton of people actively running around the Gaylord for various and sundry reasons. There was some safety and security yeah. concerns but, about um, But something like Magstock, which is a little more in nature and definitely at a campsite, is more conducive to uh, getting winded, trying to run down your friend or get run down. Come to, yes. come to Magstock as a short answer. Magstock will actually walking on uh, something that's going to have some ARG components this year. So there's, there's some other cool, we're going in a different, really cool direction for Magstock this year. But yes, I do hope that we uh, get the zombie, because the zombie game was a lot of fun on the Swag, and it's a great fit. All right, we'll have to check it out. Next. Two questions. One, what's the battery life on these things? Uh, yes. <laughs> significantly bet the... Yeah. So significantly better than last year, because last year we had color cord, which yeah. is really cool, and runs the, uses all 80 megahertz of the little processor on this thing. So it chews a lot more battery. Yeah. Um, what, what we're doing this year is less computationally intensive. I think and DAC was, did... And the screens are yeah. actually um, much more energy efficient. Um, it's surprisingly, the screen actually uses a lot less power. So um, yeah. what we found is the battery life is going to be better. We don't, I don't have an exact number, but... I think Dak was the only person to run it down, and it took him, like, I don't know, at least 20 hours to go from full to dead. So unless you keep yours on overnight, I think you'll be okay. Was a, oh, did you have a second part of that question, or...? Yeah, what's the, like, original story behind this way? The original story? Yeah. I don't know. Um, I can tell you my story. Huh? I, I suspect Charles would have more input on that. Yeah, in, that's uh, how most things end up happening at MacFest. Somebody thinks it's a cool idea and does it, and then we keep doing it because it worked out, or we sort of worked out, and we get better at it over time. I mean, that's how MacFest happened. So yeah. they threw a party, and some people came, and then we were like, Oh, we have an entire 20,000 person hotel and convention center when everybody shows up. Yeah. Uh, oops, <laughs> but cool. Yeah. And so, yes, yeah, Wadges are kind of a smaller version of that. We just kept doing it, and here we are. Yep. I can say that personally. I saw them one year, thought, oh, that's cool. Bought it the next year, which was the King Donut Swag. If anyone remembers the King Donut Swag, I played with it for a while, and I thought, 
hmm, I, I bet I can lend a hand to whoever's doing this. And uh, well, now I'm sitting on the panel. But I, I started there by emailing circuitboards and macfest.org. So again, if you're interested in participating and not just sitting on that side of the table, shoot us a note. Yeah, I, I ended up with um, uh, getting on just because uh, I was at, at MagSock with Charles and uh, it, you were eventually pulled by gravitation towards <laughs> things that Charles is working on, and I, I had played the um, the uh, the I don't remember the Space Cats was the theme last year that was Sun Cats, yeah. Okay, Sun Cats, yes. All right, uh, I I really liked the Sun Cats badge, and then uh, I was at the meeting at Magstock discussing these bat, uh, swatches, and then the concept of like an OLED came up with buttons, and it's like, oh, I can work with that. <laughs> Right. Yep. Explain the jousting. Explain the jousting. All right. Two knights get on their armor, usually helped by squires, get hoisted up onto horses. No. Um, so Johann Sebastian. I like to demonstrate jousting. You too can. I'm going to talk about it. I'm winded, man. <laughs> um, so the original game was Johann Sebastian Joust, which was for the PlayStation 3, and it would use the move controllers, if you remember those. It had like a glowy ball on top. And the goal of the game was to keep your controller as steady as possible. But everyone has controllers, which means that while you're holding yours steady, someone else is swatting at you with their other arm trying to knock yours around. Um, and so you end up with this kind of, it almost looks like a dance when you watch it from the outside, where everyone's just kind of circling each other, and every once in a while, like, shooting out an arm here or there, and like, really trying to hold theirs steady. Um, and there's, there's a musical component on the PlayStation which we kind of kind of managed because we have a buzzer, but it's a little harder when you don't have like a central TV. Um, but the joust that we have, right, you, there's two modes. There's two-player and free-for-all. So in two-player, uh, you actually pair your swatches by holding them next to each other and establish uh, a Wi-Fi communication. And then, you know, you, you play with a friend, right? You try to move theirs while holding your steady and they're doing the same thing. And then whenever someone wins, um, that gets tracked. So you can track how many wins you have in player versus player. It doesn't track your losses because we're all about positivity. <laughs> um, the other mode is free for all where there's actually no communication between the swatches, but if everyone just presses start at the same time, um, it'll tell you when you lose. And when there's only one person who hasn't lost yet, they're the winner. Does that all make sense? Cool. Anyone else? Were you all inspired by any of the previous wagons, or was it more or less a round up? Um, I mean, I was inspired to join because of previous swages, and this year's firmware, we started off with the reflector firmware as a base, tore out a bunch of stuff and built up from there. Um, I don't know if you'll count that as inspiration, but it's definitely, there's definitely a clear lineage. I'd say that, yeah, those, those, the, the, the old, um, we're, we're definitely inspired every year by what we've done before, um, and partly inspired by a desire to do something different every time. Um, we don't want to do exactly the same thing, but also we'll volunteer time thing. The volunteer team, this is a lot of work, and so we do look to reuse what we can. So in terms of the framework, the heritage, um, the ESPA 266 is just a really great platform for the price point and functionality point we're at. Um, the sort of things we're doing is just, it's such a great chip for that, um, that we've stuck with it for the higher power swages. There are some events where we've thought about doing a lower power. We have some concepts we've, th we've thrown around that would be a very low power, um, something that wouldn't even need a double A battery. Uh, if you remember the MagWest swages, uh, the full steel MagWest, the Sonic synthesizer swag, something like that. Um, that the, the King Donut was an 18 mega. Yeah, that was as well. Yeah. Um, so certainly, they'll, they'll talk, we'll, we're thinking about some concepts that might have different hardware, but when we'll be using hardware um, and just doing very different things with it, we're able to have a lot of commonality um, heritage on the uh, software on the software side, but yeah, um, we, we definitely, we want to keep things, keep things fresh. We, we love, love seeing previous year swages show up at the event. I'm really excited how many uh, 2019 swages I'm seeing already. The um, fact that I saw any was a surprise to me. <laughs> so that's, um, 
this thing. But yeah, we're, we're definitely we're looking back at what we have done and looking at what cool stuff can we do. And we've been talking actually for a few years about wouldn't it be cool to have a screen? And finally did it. Finally came down. Finally was we were, they finally came down in price to a point where we could fit it in the budget. Uh, that was that was really the big thing there, and so we we squeezed it in. And I'm glad you guys uh, listened to me argue and argue and argue that we should have a screen. I was pro screen the whole time. Pro screen. You pro screen yeah. won't if we can afford it. Well, yes. But it was going to break in half. That's true. But you know, we ran that down. And, uh, that's, yeah. uh, that's where the cool stuff comes from. All right. A bunch of it, and the stuff of it that doesn't break, you end up doing. Yeah. Uh, question right in the front. No, that's for the future. Question all the way in the back. How much downtime do you guys give yourself before the next one? Uh, so between last year's MagFest and this was, I guess, three months. Uh, before I started working on the dev kit. Previously, I think the year before, we started working in like August or September, so seven months, somewhere between the two. So it, it really depends on who on the team. I think, yeah, as, as a team, as an official project. Um, the ball doesn't really get rolling until about July. Yeah, there's, there's some stuff we can't do until the theme is announced enough, or at least internally announced enough, that we can work with it, because we, we try to do things that really fit with the theme as much as we can. Um, I've been really pushing for us to be, to have some of that info um, real, but there's also ideas, concepts, uh, Mac stock. So some of us, um, Charles and I, I know on the team that's already working on the Mac stock swag. So I'm not. That's, that's, over, <laughs> that's overlapping. So um, for some of us, um, some of us take a few months, some of us there isn't really any downtime. Listen, if you'd like to join the team and start working on January 7th, you are more than welcome to. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Um, that's actually, how much time do we have left? Oh, we still got 10 minutes. All right, I want dumb questions and questions that people are afraid to ask, the questions you're gonna ask me afterwards because you don't want everyone hearing, come on. Hit me with your best and your worst. Oh, just curious, what what was the budget that you guys actually sent out with the start of the project? Um, I'm not sure if I'm at liberty to discuss the budget, actually. Um, I can say that we had a budget number earlier this year, and we had to split it between R&D expenses and then actual manufacturing. So there was more awareness of the budget this year than prior. Um, but we bought everything, so we must have done good. <laughs> And the other uh, side of the deal is that the budget, for, the budget for this year and for last year's swag was similar. So the differences in functionality you're, you're seeing, um, it turns out one of the key takeaways for me from last year do, it was that adding any kind of case, adding that plastic diffusal, um, that costs enough that we were able to get rid of the plastic and do a screen instead. The plastic diffuser was also hugely labor intensive. Compare that, I think last year we had a team of like 12 to 16 people working two Saturdays at about 10 hours each to put them all together. It was really cool and we're never doing that again. Yeah, and, and this year again, we, we did everything in about three hours right before this panel. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, uh, the it's, it's definitely a balancing point as to what we can fit in. And we'll see, and it may be that they'll, they make different decisions in either direction in the future, but um, yeah, we've, we've definitely okay. got a solid that we know we, price point we know we can walk around. Right. Yeah. All the way in the back. Is it easier to attach your uh, swag to the this year? Uh, there's a single hole. Uh, so it's a single hole that you can clip a lanyard to, so I guess that's easier. Uh, we don't have the plastic getting in the way. Um, the downside is last year's like weird configuration melt. Like if you had enough zip ties, you could use it as a belt buckle, which I don't think anyone... Oh, no, there's a guy with a belt buckle. There you go. My dude. <laughs> that's, that's a great way to get everyone to stare at your crotch, by the way. <laughs> Um, but uh, with enough zip ties, you probably could make them a dandy. Yeah, I, I guess if you have enough zip ties this year, you can get creative, but there's only one you have mounting zip hole. Ties, you can do anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a, a little more restrictive this year, a little easier to put on a lanyard. So that leads to an odd question. Will we be able to wear many years of them as different apparel pieces eventually? If you have enough space on your body, sure. <laughs> 
I can't wait until we have like the sternum piercing swag. <laughs> it's the swag. Spoil walls. Oh, sorry, no spoilers. You didn't hear that. Ultimately, that's up to you. Yeah. <laughs> Wink, but it's on my eye that's covered. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, don't maybe obvious Ooh, that's a great question. Why didn't we do it in assembly? And actually, there was a little bit that was done in assembly. You know, I weren't expecting that, were you? Um, you know how I was saying Charles did some crazy stuff that made I2C wall? Actually, he undid the assembly. So he undid the assembly? Yeah, so, assembly. No, so initially we were using um, an assembly source code from, I think, a, someone in like Belarus or something, which would drive the I squared C lines very fast, because assembly is very fast. Um, and it worked spectacularly on the dev kit, and then started to fail when we ran into crosstalk issues. Um, so up until about a month out, there was a decent chunk of assembly as part of our source code, and then Charles replaced that with some weird looking C code, which magically works, uh, and I just left it at that. <laughs> <laughs> so, to answer, to, so to answer that question more generally, um, C was a s sweet spot for developing um, against this platform. Um, it's high level and enough, especially with me and the libraries that are available, and it's what the open tool chain for the SP is in. Um, I, th there are higher level languages that you can program in. We lose too much performance. Uh, like my, those are micro Python, and that yeah. makes him make a face whenever I bring it up. But uh, we lose too much performance there, and assembly. It would be really cool if somebody made a like demo scene foam whale yeah. that was pure assembly. But um, for the most part, actually speaking of weird demo scene stuff, I did do a demo where I really smashed the Slack <laughs> movie down far enough that I managed to fit Schleck on the swage. Um, um. It, it's a potato pointed at a potato filming another potato, but it kind of fit. Now I had to take everything off, else off to do it. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see somebody do some uh, crazy demo scene stuff. But in terms of the effort that we have, the, the C was, framework was a good, good middle ground. And for even a little more context, there is an RTOS package for the ESP where you can do your RTOS and C. Uh, we don't even use that. There's too much overhead in the RTOS. Um, we want bare metal control as much as possible. We want to know everything that's happening all the time. Um, and I actually had to go in this year to the linker file and readjust the section sizes because there was too much stuff. Um, so there was a decent amount of fiddling just to get everything to fit. Um, so we're, we're running up against that limit, which is exciting. Silly question. Good. Silly answer. Small pasty sweat, yes or no? Yes. <laughs> or big ones. <laughs> you got a video about testing your hardware? Oh, right. Yeah, sure. Well, like manufacturing defects? Uh, yes. Here. Well, you know what? We'll just run it. We got two minutes. That's a great thing to close out. Uh, if there's sound. Should be sound. Should be and is are two different things. Uh, are you out putting on your HDMI? Maybe. Oh, did you plug into the other? No. Oh, hold on. Hold on. There's a process. <laughs> Standard Q and A. Yep. This is what happens when you do it live. So now is it doing sound on HDMI or now we want it on speaker? Oh hey, it's Charles. Yay. Hello. I'm not sure what they told you guys about me. It was all good. Everything. Okay. Okay. I don't know where the sound is or where it's going. Um, we'll watch it without sound and maybe I'll say some words. Which is even more exciting than before. So right. So this is the programmer and this is how you set it up. There are a couple of switches. Uh, which are useful for development, but if you're programming it, you want it to have it on, you want to have it in five volts, and you want to have a jumper between ground and SCL, which forces the wedge to boot into programming mode, not boot into normal mode. Uh, there was also a jumper behind it that was there for power reasons. Um, 
This board was red. There was another one that was blue. Mm -hmm. I'm colorblind. <laughs> uh, is this video not actually playing? Yeah, you just were talking for quite a while on that point. No, oh, apparently I was talking for quite a while. Uh, so we also had this uh, Python GUI which would do the programming. So you'd set this up on a computer, like just a laptop. Um, and then you had to make sure your swag was running on USB power, not AA power. And then all you would do is plug it in. And that was the wacko one that had the screen on backwards, which is why it's all tilty. Uh, the LEDs would flash kind of disco for about 10 seconds or so. You'd get a little green notification that you flashed, and that was pretty much it. And then we had uh, test mode firmware, which hopefully no one gets. Uh, if you do, uh, track us down, I guess, in stops or something. Uh, but we had a little spinny banana just to prove that the OLED was working. The LEDs would go around in a circle. It's playing a song now, but you can't hear it. It's Black Dog by Led Zeppelin, which is one of my favorites. Uh, and it would display the accelerometer data on the screen as well. So if you give it a tilt or two, um, it would respond. YouTube muted it for copyright reasons. <laughs> you know what? That's probably what happened, yeah. <laughs> oh, and when you press the buttons, it would draw buttons on the screen just to prove that it worked. Uh, so somewhere halfway across the world, there were some assembly workers who would plug them in, press some buttons, give it a tilt, and then throw it in another box. And that guarantees that we get 3,000 working swatches and not 2,500 working ones and 500 busted ones. Um, if you email politely, uh, I will send you a link to that video. I think it's hidden on YouTube at the moment. If you really want to hear my voice again, um, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, all right, we've got two minutes left, so I guess if anyone has a question for Charles, or you just gaze upon his magnificent beard. Uh, I'm curious, how much of the story did you actually tell of how these things got here? Uh, we talked about persistent cattle. Okay, good, good. Yeah. That's, uh, I guess the one thing which you guys probably didn't know is that this morning, um, we basically... So what we'd been doing is we were tracking the flights based off of the departure times and like searching it so we would know where the packages were at any given time. So I was up until like 4 a.m. last night waiting for this plane to take off. And I went and I looked at the plane history and I noticed that the DHL flight is almost always like an hour or two late. And I was like, okay, I'm just gonna go to bed right now. And so <laughs> I woke up, flight was already in the air, it actually was already landing, uh, went to DHL, I actually had to get my, my dad came to DHL with me and we loaded all the things up. We headed straight down here and that's when all the other craziness happened. And also, I think we had three minutes of, of leeway on getting uh, the batteries to uh, the, the where the swages are being handed out. What is oh, it? Fan? Merch. The merch, yeah, yeah. Getting the batteries to merch. So that was crazy. Okay, I'm done. Yep. Uh, all right, I see a wrap it up sign over there, so we're going to wrap it up. If you have any other questions, I'll be hanging out out front. You can ask me personally. Email circuitboards at magfest.org if you want. You've been a great audience. Thank you. Good night. Woo!